Good evening and welcome to Space Oddities. Thank you for joining us on this Monday, which I believe is a bank holiday in the UK. Hope you're all well. If this is your first time here, you are particularly welcome. We are Space Oddities and uh, we bring the universe to you. And uh, joining us to do that uh, tonight, we've got uh, Daz and Rachel and Jonathan and Lou. How are you guys? Good evening. Good evening. Lord, how many bank holidays do you have over there? <laughs> Not enough. Any chance we can get? <laughs> well, I think um, I think you should should allow them that in the UK because uh, the rest of the year they get um, not very many at all. So um, so so there you are. This is an added added bonus thanks to um, booking Charles getting um, crowned, as it were. Uh, anyway, on tonight's show, we've got um, a pack program, and tonight uh, Lou is going to be telling us about Titan, the moon of the mysterious moon of, of Saturn. It's the first in a new series that we're, we're uh, starting here on Space Oddities called Moon of the Week, and the first one is indeed Titan. So we can look forward greatly to, um, to Lou telling us all about uh, that, uh, that incredibly interesting uh, little world orbiting, orbiting Saturn. We're also going to be taking a look at space stations, uh, present and future, what what have we got what of uh, various space agencies and companies got planned for the future of space stations and uh we've got of course not to mention uh which we try not to jonathan's uh, neo watch he's back with another selection of uh, interesting <laughs> about uh, near earth objects and um and we've got some other stuff as well. So uh, we hope that you will stay with us for the duration. It's a beautiful evening here in Spain, not a cloud in the sky, although needless to say it will probably cloud over if I want to do some astronomy later. But, um, but we had some storms yesterday and they appear to have passed over, so fingers crossed for a clear night. Now, uh, first thing I want to mention this evening, obviously I'd like to say thank you to our sponsor, Wilder Valley Optics, for supporting us in our endeavours here at Space Oddities. Also like to say an enormous thank you to those of you who are continuing to buy us coffees week on week. It's very kind and it does, uh, it does help our coffers and uh, allow us to do uh, things with that money that we hope you'll like. And um, we've got also, not forgetting at the moment, we've got our competition, our May competition. And in case you didn't catch the details last week, here is what the competition is uh, all about. So we're calling this a juicy competition because it is all about the Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer, which recently departed for the Icy Moons of Jupiter. And um, what we've got uh, for that, the lovely prize, the courtesy of Wilder Valley Optics, is this wonderful 70 millimeter Celestron Refracting Telescope. And this could be yours. It's suitable for uh, a child or a beginner in, in astronomy. It would suit a child perfectly as their first telescope. And here's what you have to do to win it in case you weren't here last week. What you have to do, uh, first of all, the competition is open to children up to and including the age, age of 12 who are resident in the UK or Ireland. And what we'd like the children to do is to create an image in any medium of something related to the ESA JUICE mission, the Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer, as I said. And um, when they've created an image, photograph it and email it to us at the usual address, that being spaceoddityslive at gmail.com. Uh, if you could entitle the email competition entry, that will help us to find them. And uh, do please include the name and age of the entrant in your email. We'd like you to send them in by midnight this coming Friday. Um, that's Friday the 12th of May. So midnight is the cutoff date for receiving those emails of yours. And uh, we do have to say, unfortunately, that in the interests of competition fairness, any received after that uh, date and time, I'm afraid, will not be eligible for inclusion. And we're going to judge the entries here at the Space Auditors. The panel will judge the entries, and the one we consider the best will win that lovely telescope. Now, what more do you want? Um, needless to say, the panel's decision is final. There are no alternative prizes or cash alternatives, and we will be announcing the winner this time next week on next uh, Monday's live stream. So um, 
that's your the task. The children should uh, get drawing or painting or whatever they want to do. We will allow um, computer generated images as well if they want to do it on the computer. And uh, just to give you some help with that, uh, you can, of course, Google JUICE ESA, European Space Agency. If you Google that, you'll find um, JUICE immediately uh, if you want some inspiration for images. Um, if you don't want to do that, um, there's the address for the uh, JUICE page at the uh, European Space Agency. And I've included a QR code there in case you want to scan that now to go straight to the, uh, that web page. And uh, we should look forward to receiving the, the entries. We do like um, opening our competitions to children to get them and encourage their interest in astronomy. So uh, if you want to enter the competition, we need to receive them by midnight on Friday, your entries, that is. So there we are. That's details of the competition. And uh, if you do have any questions or you want to know anything about the competition, feel free to email us at the, uh, the same address, spaceoddityslive at gmail.com. So there you are. So, um, well, good luck in the competition for the children. That's all I want to say. And uh, we're going to go straight over now. Unfortunately, Roger's unable to join us tonight. So we're going to go straight over to uh, Rachel with her weekly viewers gallery. So what have we got in the gallery uh, this week, Rachel? We have got some of our uh, usual troublemakers <laughs> making an appearance. <laughs> uh, nice. We're starting off with uh, Andy, and I know he's just got his brand new uh, scope. He's took himself an upgrade. So this is his first light with his new scope. Wow. Um, of the Whirlpool Nebula. And he's given us, again, lots and lots of detail, but it's a uh, 35 nice. minute exposures yeah it is and it's uh, a real mm. beauty <laughs> that the is detail is the the corker yeah the well detail done, even andy. the star color is just beautiful so well done andy <laughs> fantastic well done <laughs> uh then we've got one by jerry we've got a sharp plus 2284 in monosterous um and he's taken this again using his like stream filter this time um using PixInsight and photoshop to process right wow the colors on that and jerry mm. just seems to find things i've never seen or heard of and i just end up googling for hours after the show <laughs> so more homework tonight thank you jerry there's some real depth in that image yeah, the, absolutely. Uh, the, the background and the background. Mm. Mm. What, yeah. Wonderful depth, wonderful depth, isn't it? To that. Yeah. Beautiful. Well done. Uh, we've got another one by Jerry. He's been very busy, which is the Sunflower Galaxy. Um, and again, this is such a really pretty target. It looks so smooth. Oh my goodness me! <laughs> I want mm. to paddle yeah, in it a little fantastic. bit. <laughs> And you're sure you're not copying these from the from the Hubble series? <laughs> I, just, I don't know. I, I know the standard people are getting from their garden now is just getting it's getting silly, really. Nice galaxy <laughs> in the upper right here too. Yeah, there's one. Yeah. That is lovely. Yeah, good job, Jerry. And again, he's been very busy. Um, and we've got also the needle galaxy. Now I'm going to go for what are we going for? Is it Coma Berenices? Coma Berenices? What's our um, votes on the pronunciation of this one? I always say Coma Berenices. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. I do. But I've heard Berenices and I'm like, oh, I don't know now. <laughs> <laughs> so this is another one by Jerry. And it's such a, a nice galaxy, this one. I really mm -hmm. do like this one. Lovely. Yeah. My rule of thumb, if you can't pronounce the name, just call it Dave. <laughs> <laughs> As in, I'm sorry, I can't do that, Dave. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then we've got one by Johnny. Uh -huh. um, you can tell this is our Irish because I can never be bothered to put any more detail than it is. If I think this, I'm sure the Irish Nebula is in Cepheus. I'm going to go with Cepheus. Um, and we took that about, I think, about wow. two or three weeks ago. Um, wow. And mm. he's wanting to get more, because if you keep pushing this image, you can really get that sort of the dark dust clouds around it, because it's a reflection nebula. Um, so we're collecting more, but obviously we get about an hour of dark at the minute and a full moon. So <laughs> it's, uh, 
it's becoming a challenge and I go to bed far too early now, so I just leave him to it. <laughs> uh, then we've got an Aurora by Lee. Um, oh, lovely. <laughs> and he's happy to report no doggers or dog walkers this time. Um, <laughs> So he said it was cloudy, but he he got you know some images, and I think he did a really good job. Mm. He did a fantastic, mm. lovely, lovely. Nice, nice square background too. Yeah, beautiful. And that's from uh, Della Ball in Cornwall. So thank you, Lee. Well done, Lee. That's lovely. Uh, and then we've got Chris O'Riordan swooping in with a witch's broom and Pickering's triangle, uh, which is obviously in Cygnus, uh, known as the Vale Nebula, Western Vale. Um. And this was his first and to date only attempt of a mosaic of two frames, each approximately three hours in duration, which is a very good mosaic. I can see no joy in there, Chris. So. No, that's really 3D, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, alone. I always feel like you I need glasses with this one. <laughs> I've been looking for my 3D glasses. And my <laughs> it does feel, yeah. it has that feel to it. <laughs> um, and I'm guessing, it. did he say it's starless? I mean, it is starless, but I don't know if he called it starless. Starless um, and Bible Obviously, black. this is a starless image. Um, yeah. So, yeah, really nice. Amazing. Thank you. Well and done. I believe that is our gallery this week. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Rachel, as ever, for, um, for showing us those. And while you were speaking, somebody's just snuck into the, uh, to the studio. Welcome, Simon. How are you? <laughs> I'm fine. Yourselves? Oh, good to see you. Hi, well, I think everybody's fine. Ah, so it's been a while. How are you? It's been ages. Oh, I'm great. I'm a little bit more grey. Yeah. Um, but that's that's doing all the outreach <laughs> with the kids. <clears throat> yeah, it, it's, it's not going to be something that's uh, uh, going to keep your hair colour if you spend uh, uh, loads of time in classrooms um, watching little Johnny destroy everything and just smiling. It was me. <laughs> it was it's me. It's insured. Just keep smiling. It's insured. <laughs> I, thought, I thought destroying <laughs> telescopes was your job. <laughs> oh, well, I paint them. And if they survive the painting, then that, that's fine. But uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, it, it, it's normally the, the time of year when we start packing up because uh, we, we've lost the night time now, um, the, the true darkness. But uh, we do loads of solar stuff and we do, um, we've do. we managed to steal a planetarium down here in Bath. Uh, so we're going around uh, with that as well. So um, you can't stop us. Absolutely. And, and for those viewers who, who, who uh, don't have the pleasure of knowing you, Simon, can you tell us just a, a little bit about what you do? Um, I, I, I'm one of the people that help run a, a local astronomical society down here um, in the southwest of the UK, uh, the city of Bath, and we've got about 100 and 305 members within our society. But um, uh, just like other societies, we do loads of talks and sort of helping people get the best of the kit, but we also do lots and lots of outreach. Uh, so that we go into lots of schools, we go to lots of young people's organisations. Um, we've got scouts and guides who all have uh, sort of like their astronomy or space badges. Um, right. Lots of people scratch their heads when they say, well, what do we do for that? Well, we'll come along and we'll sort that out for you. And uh, we'll bring the telescopes, we'll bring planetariums, we'll bring all kinds of things um, and uh, sort of uh, make the sessions fun. So today I was trying to purchase rockets, but not the big explosive kinds, the pneumatic ones. So <laughs> it's not just boring uh, in terms of sort of humdrum stuff. You also get to have fun in the classrooms as well. And uh, I've only been once chucked out of a school for creating a really bad mess. <laughs> 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 right okay oh lou disappeared but he's back again okay. you've got eclipse lou <laughs> uh -huh. right thank you simon well, it's lovely to see you and thank you for joining us on this one evening and um now i think it's about time we did a little bit of neo watching and um and to <laughs> wake up to you uh there's a man who needs uh, no introduction Good evening, good evening, and welcome to the Neo Watch desk. Here it is. Up, 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 up. Uh, first and foremost, um, there's been uh, the usual patter of news about um, certain close approaches and, and, and measurements of certain asteroids, but nothing really uh, out of the ordinary with regards to the, the way in which the press are dealing with things, so I just sort of ignore that at the moment. Um, I did pick up in the, on the news, though, that um, uh, China is considering its uh, first near-Earth asteroid defense demonstration. They're eyeing up an asteroid uh, around 2030 
which are going to uh, try uh, via kinetic means to actually push the asteroid um, or deflect it away into what appears to be, uh, from the Chinese government, a manageable orbit. Um, so uh, the asteroid, like I said, 2030, divert the orbit. Bit, uh, with the aim to have the ability to actually uh, or, or uh, to control the asteroid um, by about 2045. So whereas they're pushing it out the way, the, the long term plan is to actually <clears throat> still have some guidance on the actual asteroid sort of 15 years later. So it's a it's a it's a quite a profound uh, and and quite um, significant attempt by the Chinese to actually um, uh, not only steer the asteroid away that they're going to select, but also to actually manage its path well after the actual diversion has taken place. So, right. yeah, so by 2030, that's what they're looking at at the moment. They haven't actually nominated which one, though. They haven't, I, can't, I can't find any... A uh, No, <laughs> no. I, 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 I can't find any reference to which asteroid they're even looking at, which would have given me some idea of steer as to where to go to find out exactly how they hope to do that or, or, or at what uh, point they hope to intersect the orbit in order to achieve any kinetic impact. So um, that remains very much a mystery, and I wouldn't put money on it either. I think it, it's still very much on the drawing board. However, um, the U.S. by uh, the same comparison. Uh, now, the United States uh, National Science and Technology Council, they've updated their country's plans uh, for dealing with potentially dangerous asteroids. It's a 38-page document. Uh, it outlines six goals, but the goals are virtually the same as they have been for quite a number of decades now. It's a case of uh, strengthening the ability to detect track and develop technologies to deflect hazardous, hazardous near-Earth objects. And it's almost increasing uh, international preparedness uh, for such events. So there's no real no real difference to anything else. It, it, it's just a case of uh, monitoring, check-in. As we are at the moment, there's been no differences there. And uh, mm. then generally preparing uh, for any potential strike. Now, the you mentioned Apophis there. The closest pass that we do know at the moment uh, is in 2029. That appears to be the one at the top of the list at the moment. That, that is Apophis, which is, she's, uh, uh, or, or it, or they, a uh, 335 metre wide asteroid. Uh, the, the current projection for the pass uh, is around about 19,635 miles, uh, which is, yeah, uh, stingingly close, but there is nothing... 19,000 miles? Yes, 19,635 is the current estimate about, uh, I think it's the June of that year when it when it's due to actually uh, pass. So that is, uh, that, that is uh, at the moment, the, the one that they're, the, they're most concerned about, but still, you know, given that distance, uh, you know, it's 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 neither here nor there. I, I wouldn't put too much emphasis on that. But um, the thing is, though, when we talk about um, well, looking at what the Chinese are doing and, and look at the the preparedness sort of globally, uh, we're just hoping that between now and 2030, we don't <laughs> actually have any any rogue visitors, uh, which always amazes me. Well, well, we'll do that then. We'll do that now, 20, 30, 40 years time. But it's it's I think the the, the it's a little bit more immediate pressing than that to, to actually say well we'll look at it then we'll, we'll deal with it then um mm. that 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 problem uh, exists on a, on a on a on a daily basis a monthly basis so i'd rather them got a little bit more um rather than being so animated a little bit more active about what they intend to do about things rather than just well we'll we'll, we'll see we'll whatever but it is nice by the same token to see the chinese taking an interest in that but i am very skeptical as to whether or not it'll actually come to anything um uh, courtesy, courtesy of ESA, uh, the European Space Agency, uh, the current total of near-Earth asteroids as of today stands at 31,882. I believe in the last fortnight we've added 82 there to make it the 882. So again, uh, a lot of consistency over the last three to four weeks as to the amount that has been uh, uh, defined, if you like, and, and processed in this um um uh, analogy of of what we've actually know of of near earth asteroids only 1478 of those remain in the risk list um 
the current nearest comet, that's been stuck on about 120 for about a year or so now. It's gone to 121, but again, I can't find the information to actually see which comet has, has made it to 121, so leave that with me. I'll, I'll sort that out. Um, <laughs> current known asteroids with good old information. This is a, uh, it, it's still it's up in the it's at 1 million 167,575 that we've got decent orbital information on at the moment. And as it stands, near Earth objects discovered since the start of the year, that stands at around about 620 at the moment, uh, which is a little bit up on, 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 on previous years. But again, it's the detection process that's enabling us to, to keep these figures um, more buoyant than they have been. But yeah, so hats off to the Chinese for doing something. Hats off, uh, I think, uh, for um, at least keeping focus, uh, especially from the US, on current plans to do something or, or at least engage with it rather than seeing nothing in the press whatsoever. But we're still uh, uh, massively short of, of, of uh, in my opinion, being ready or at least having some something in place bar um, of the just talk, which appears to be on the table at the moment. But um, yeah, as it stands at the moment, um, that's it from the Neo Watch desk. Do, 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 do. Oh, thank you very okay much. then yeah because andy andy weller in the chat says uh, i think he's being a bit cynical uh with the chinese testing their uh, deviation on the asteroid he said and then two years later it hits the usa um and uh do you uh do you like cricket jonathan uh i do actually yes uh, is, is, is yeah because um Derek Abbott says you sound like uh, Derek uh, Car uh, Colin Compton. Oh, there you are then. There you are then. <laughs> 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 yeah, you can sort of, you can sort of hear that, can't you? Oh, my dear, mm. my dear real thing. Yeah, with all his facts and figures. Oh, yeah, my, my dear real thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Back to astronomy. Yeah, Steve says, let's hope Aphophis doesn't suffer a wobble from a random mm. wanderer like Oumuamua in the meantime. Yeah, yeah that's absolutely. True. Mm. Hey, yeah. yeah. One that's, course correction and it's. <laughs> yeah. Aphophis uh, is something that, you know, everybody needs to keep a very, very close yeah, eye on. Yeah, absolutely. It'll only take a little nudge here and there, a little bit of gravitational shove, and it's, it, it's, it'll make a big difference. And, and that does happen, of course. It that does, does absolutely. Happen. Oh, yeah. No worries. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And this is why we visit comets and asteroids, because we want to understand their physical properties, mm -hmm. especially their surface properties, which tells you how much radiation they absorb and emit and at what wavelengths. And that can play a role over long periods of time, the solar radiation pressure in um, determining an asteroid's path. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, of course, we got. Uh, you mentioned that. We've got the... Um sample return haven't we from osiris rex yep, uh, later this year September, so uh something to look forward to absolutely yeah. absolutely and uh, and talking of uh later this year in fact later this month on the 30th of this month um space oddities celebrates its first anniversary yes we've uh, we've been going for just about a year now God knows where the time went. Um, of course, I don't look any different. Everybody else does. But uh, anyway, um, so we'd like to do something special for our first anniversary program, which uh, probably won't be the 30th of May, but it'll be the nearest Monday to that. So if you have any uh, anything you would like us to do for our first anniversary program, anything special, then uh, drop us an email at uh, spaceoddityslive at gmail.com, as always. And uh, tell us what you'd like to see us doing. We've got a few ideas, but we'd like to throw it open to you, our viewers, who are stuck with us through uh, thick and thin. And, yeah, so if you've got any ideas of anything you'd like to see on our um, first anniversary program, then uh, then do tell us. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Jonathan. I uh, hope we'll be You're back welcome. with uh, with even more. It's, uh, mm. it's absolutely fascinating stuff. It's just found a bulb I've been looking for for a Vauxhall. <laughs> that was random. It was, wasn't it? Yeah, it's a, a stop tail, stop tail bulb for the box. Um, Thank you. Save it to our first <laughs> anniversary show. Jonathan finds it. Yeah, to open it. A year later, Jonathan finds it. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, this is uh, actually Daydream Astro. This is something we were talking about before the program. Um, I say we had there we are. What was I saying, guys? T shirts yeah. <laughs> and, um, mm -hmm. and uh, Daydream Astro. We have um, we have plans to do that. 
as summer is approaching. Um, we, we did actually have a plan to make a special limited edition first anniversary t-shirt, which will, of course, be twice the normal price. And, um, and uh, cheap at half the price, though, obviously. We are looking for that. We ha we'll bring you news on that soon. But thank you for the suggestion, and it's something that, um, that we have been thinking about for a while, but obviously in the winter there wasn't much point. So uh, now summer is upon us. Well, it is here anyway. I don't know about you guys, but um, but uh, there we are. We we will look into it and try and produce some uh, some t-shirts for you because we'd love to do that, and I'd love one as well. I, I need a new t a couple of new t-shirts for the summer. Mm -hmm. So there we are. Uh, okay. Yeah, and Andy um, Andy Weller is asking if we're going to do a live launch <laughs> of Rachel's baby. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> we're going to... no, he didn't actually say live launch. He said live. Yeah. <laughs> Don't use the word launch. Yeah. That sounds terrifying. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> we don't mean to imply that you think that we're too big to use the space, <laughs> but it's an idea. I uh, have, to, have to be on a, on a, on a Falcon 9, I think. Um, <laughs> so there we are. Uh, okay, lovely suggestion. Thank you, Andrew. That's great. All right, then. Let's move on. Now, we've been, uh, we were talking of, uh, quite a while ago now about doing something about space stations because... We all, I'm sure, know of the International Space Station, even if you haven't seen it sailing through the skies, which I've done on many, many an occasion, and I, I'm sure mo most of the panellists here have seen it lots of times. I'm still having arguments with people when I pointed out to them that, uh, that maintain it's a plane and not a space station, but, uh, but there you are, that's life. And um, we thought we'd put together something for you about space stations, What's, what space stations are up there, what are the plans for future space stations, because they don't all involve space stations in Earth orbit. Da, da, da. Anyway, so uh, what we'll do now, I'll just uh, get this presentation going. And um, here's our thing on, uh, on space stations. Just give me a second. And um, space stations, we're going to look at six. So basically, the first one is indeed the International Space Station. It's grown quite a lot since it was uh, first built. And it was a joint project uh, between five space agencies, NASA, Roscosmos, Canadian Space Agency, JAXA, and the ESA, although the US and Russia these days are the main partners. And when they built the space station, it was sort of a case of, well, we built the station, what are we going to do with it? But there is a, a huge range of science experiments that's done on the space station. And the equipment for that is flown up by, um, by Progress and by the SpaceX Dragon. And uh, the results are, are returned back down to Earth. Now, over the last few years, it's really become an outpost for studying the effects of long-term space flight on the human body. Because as we know, uh, microgravity is not good for the human body. So there's a lot of research for future long-term space missions going on at the space station. It was built between 1998 and 2000. And um, its life, uh, we understand, is going to be extended until 2030, although Russian plans for the moment are, in the light of uh, world events, uh, a little uncertain. Russia keeps threatening to pull out, uh, but at the moment they, they seem to be uh, staying in, but we don't know what their plans are for the future. So that's the International Space Station. Then we've got an upcoming private space station, uh, this is what it looks like, and it's called Orbital Reef, and there are quite a few partners involved in this, being led by Blue Origin and Sierra Space uh, and Boeing, but also involved are Amazon Web Services, Mitsubishi, Mitsubishi, I can never say that, Heavy Industries, Arizona State University, Redwire, and Genesis Engineering. Now, the plans behind this are a little nebulous. Uh, Jeff Bezos has said that he wants it to become, if you like, a sort of a an all-purpose business park. And uh, what that means is that it will be used for all sorts of re research, but really as a commercial entity to rent it out to private companies to do whatever they want to with. So Jeff Bezos has had this uh, idea for a long time that uh, it would be great if we could move heavy industry off the earth and put it in space to stop it polluting our planet. And this is really, I think, the first step. The launch for this is a, the launch date is a little nebulous. Um, uh, their website says by 2027, 
although current events would seem to put that back at least by a year or two. Uh, the reason for that is, uh, as I'll now explain, um, Sierra will be supplying their Dream Chaser space plane for lifting um, cargo up to Orbital Reef. The Dream Chaser hasn't flown yet, although they've done uh, tests in the atmosphere, landing tests, all that sort of thing. And that, that looks a brilliant vehicle. It will land like any uh, plane and it can land at any airport in the world. Um, I think, guys, uh, Daz, do you remember this? Is, is it made in flight uh, meant for later this year? Daz? No, don't know. Don't know. Oh, okay. Well, I think um, I think it, the um, I think the, the the maiden flight of the Dream Chaser is meant to be later this year. Uh, also involved. Yeah, sorry, Andy, I was on mute. I was on mute. Sorry. Okay. Yes, it's chalked in for later this year, but as you know, everything changes every five minutes, so okay. it's a watch this space scenario. Okay. Uh, Boeing are meant to be providing the crew transfer facilities with the Boeing Starliner. But as we know, the Starliner is an incredibly troubled program and has been nothing short of an unmitigated disaster for Boeing. What its future is, nobody knows. And uh, we certainly wouldn't be surprised if it's cancelled altogether because they are losing a lot of money with, with Starliner, our Boeing. Uh, so, you know, whether the Starliner will actually be involved, who knows. And also the, uh, the heavy lifting to build the space station is going to be done by Blue Origin's New Glen. And this keeps having its maiden flight put back. It's now been put back, I think, till they're saying late this year, early next year, um, but maybe even later than that. So the fact that, you know, of the three space vehicles that are meant to be building and supplying this station, none of them have actually ever flown uh, would seem to indicate that they're not going to do it by 2027, in, in my humble opinion. So that's the orbital reef. Anyway, uh, then we come to, of course, the Chinese space station, the space station, I should say, which is called Tiangong uh, or in English, Heavenly Palace. This has been built by the China Man Space Agency. And as you can see in the in the sidebar, lots of different purposes quoted for this space station. Um, basically everything to do with space flight and uh, long term um, habitation of orbiting outposts. And it's also going to serve as a next uh, uh, platform for next generation orbital vehicles for testing and so on and so forth. It was launched in 2021, as you may well know, and um, it's going to eventually consist of six modules. And by the end of last year, they'd actually expanded it to three. So that's the Tiangong uh, Heavenly Palace Chinese Space Station. Then we've got a space station from a company called Axiom, who you may have heard of. And this is the Axiom station. Now, this is a little bit of a unique, um, well, you can't have a bit unique, but it is a unique design because this will be built as modules attached to the International Space Station. And when it's complete, it will separate from the ISS and become a space station in its own right. And um, Axiom say that it's uh, for uh, research, manufacturing, development for numerous industries, they're using techniques that are available only in microgravity, uh, and so on and so forth. And the first section of this space station is planned to be launched in 2025, and I think they're still on target to, to do that. Then we've got an extra, the first extraterrestrial space station, this being, of course, the Lunar Gateway, which is going to be a space station in orbit around the moon. And the idea behind this is it will be, if you like, a staging post for the crewed moon landings that are coming up later this decade. Now, the, um, the plans for this are well, really uncertain at the moment. It's being built by NASA, the European Space Agency, the Japanese Space Agency, and the Canadian Space Agency. And plans for it did include initially that it would be in orbit around the moon to be used by the first crewed Artemis landing, which is at the moment scheduled for 2025. But um, apparently that won't be ready because the space station is, is nowhere near ready. And um, exact details and timelines are a bit hard to come by. It's a funding problem mainly with Congress being at the back of it, of course. 
but uh, the plan still is for for NASA and the other space agencies I mentioned to build this, so the astronauts have got a, a sort of a stopping off point to and from the lunar surface. And then lastly, we've got an interesting one um, called the Star Lab. This is being or will be built by a company called NanoRacks in conjunction with Voyager Space and Lockheed Martin. And they intend it to be the first continuously crewed free-flying commercial space station to serve NASA and space agencies around the globe. And um, the aim is to conduct investigations, advance scientific discovery, uh, and foster individual activity in microgravity. But uh, there's no launch date or timeline available for this yet. Mm -hmm. And uh, details are, again, are a bit scarce about it at the moment. So there you have it. That's, uh, that's the um, a little bit about the, um, the space stations. So, Daz, I think you, you found one that uh, yeah, just included. Yeah, it's just, um, it was only announced, well, I've only seen news about it the last week, and it's the Europeans getting in on the act, and it's aerospace company, Airbus, uh, Airbus designers. Um, so, of course, this is a spin-off. Uh, th these uh, companies also have uh, their hands in Ariane uh, rockets, um, but they're building a space station, which they're going to call Loop. That's L double O P. Mm. Um, so, as we know, the uh, International Space Station is coming to an end around about 2030. Um, well, hopefully, it'll last that long. And uh, and as you were saying about the Axiom, hopefully, the Axiom um, in that meantime will be built um, as part of the ISS. Mm -hmm. ISS. <laughs> yeah, only two in the ISS. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the ISIS, um, <laughs> the ISS. Um, and, of course, the first uh, stage is uh, supposed to be uh, built on the, there. I think it was Axiom using the inflatable ones. Uh, yes, indeed. Um, they're looking at... Yeah, so um, they, they'll be building their, start building their um, space station on the International Space Station. And... Um, then it will actually grow, and then when the International Space Station is decommissioned, it will leave and be a space station on right. its own um, right. merit. Um, but with the uh, with that finishes, but the difference with the loop, um, which is the the European um, space station, um, it's going to have artificial gravity, and they'll be using a centrifuge. Um, now, how this is works, they're not very clear about, um, but in one of the sections, it will be able to produce artificial gravity. And by varying the speeds um, of the actual centrifuge, um, they will be able to simulate uh, the gravity of places like the moon and Mars. So if you're traveling to Mars, if you can acclimatize the uh, astronauts to uh, the Mars uh, gravity, then they won't have to do so much in the way of acclimatization when they actually get there. Um, but it's basically, it's uh, eight meters in diameter. Mm -hmm. It's eight meters tall. Now, this is just one oh, right. section, um, and it's on three levels. Now, it, uh, depending upon whereabouts you are in this station, it's been built so that as you move around the station, you will get better protection from solar radiation. Um, so you can either be in the outer parts, but as you move inside, you get more protection. Um, to actually travel between the two, the levels, there is a tunnel, a central tunnel, which is surrounded by walls of glass. Um, it's like greenhouses, so they'll be growing their own vegetables, their, their uh, lettuce, their cucumbers and things like that. Um, and it's uh, it'll have a gymnasium to keep them fit. Um, but also it's been designed that it can be um, attached to um, the lunar gateway. Um, so it can actually be taken, if it's taken up there and actually put as a module on the lunar gateway to expand the lunar gateway. Again, with the gravitational, the artificial gravity, you can acclimatize astronauts to the gravity of right. the moon. Um, and so it can be exp expanded. Um, so it can get even bigger. Um, and it's just it's just one of these. It's just come out, like I said, it was announced uh, on the 3rd, I do believe. 
Um, and hopefully this will uh, get off the ground and get the Europeans in the uh, space station industry. Right. Thank you so, uh, well, it's, yeah. it's funny you should mention um, the, uh, the inflatables, as it were, uh, because I've got a little bit about that as well. So when you talk about inflatable models, uh, this is basically what you're, you're talking about. And uh, the uh, idea behind these inflatable models is obviously they're very light, much lighter than the metal. They are multi-layered, so they offer much bigger protection or much greater protection in orbit against uh, micrometeoroids and other bits of space debris floating about, which we know there is uh, far too much mm -hmm. of. And the pioneering work on these was done by this man, Robert Bigelow. Now, he's an American businessman. He's not an engineer. He's not a scientist. He's a businessman. And when he was young, he was very interested in space. And he knew that he didn't have the maths nor the, the other engineering skills to actually go into space professionally. So what he thought was that if he made enough money as a businessman, he could hire other people to push his ideas forward in space um, and uh, he would just supply the money. So he did and he became very rich as the owner of the Budget Suites of America hotel chain, which um, I'm not familiar with. I don't know you've heard of that, Lou. Uh, but um, he became very rich as a result of this and came up with the idea of building these inflatable uh, space modules. We shouldn't call them inflatable, actually. His term for them is expandable. So these are expandable space modules. He actually had partnerships with uh, NASA and ULA to develop these ideas further and actually launched two experimental expandable modules into space, they, them being Genesis 1 in 2006 and Genesis 2 in 2007. They were launched to orbit and tested, and they worked out just fine. Then there was a plan to build an orbiting hotel using this type of module. And he was going to partnership with ULA to do that. And a three-day space, uh, a three-day stay in one of these space hotels would set you back a mere five million dollars. So it wasn't a mass market thing, obviously. Unfortunately, um, when COVID came, it really hit his company badly, and he was forced to lay off the entire worksheet, uh, worksheet workforce in uh, 2020. And really, for all intents and purposes, his company is now dead. And in fact, in 2021, he actually sued NASA for just over a million dollars for development work he claimed he'd done for NASA that uh, he was never paid for. But nothing much has been heard of him since. Um, and these, these uh, expandable modules are quite remarkable. I mean, here's one for one of the planned orbiting space stations. You can see it's absolutely huge. And... Uh, you know, just goes to show the scale of his his uh, his ambition and his plans. And uh, he wasn't restricting it to Earth orbit as well. There were also plans for lunar bases to use these. These would be ideal for lunar bases with protection against micrometeoroids and radiation, of course. And um, and what a shame that his company seems to have folded. But of course, these ideas are now being taken by other uh, taken forward by other companies. So, um, as you said, as we can expect to see these types of modules being used to build some of these space stations that I was uh, actually uh, talking about. So there we are. So Robert Bigelow, a pioneer in this sort of uh, sort of thing, but um, unfortunately, his his company failed. Yeah, I know there was some concern about what these uh, the materials used to make these things. But when they've tested them, they've met the composite materials that they've used to actually make the inflatable outer skin mm. is is harder still. This yeah. is harder still, and in fact, it's a, it um, it survives meteor impact uh, in testing better than actually steel does. Mm. So uh, these things are well durable. They uh, hopefully will be long lasting, um, and they're the way to go, as you said, even for. Um, Mars or, or or the moon and things like that to so use them they're instantly there and also because they are collapsible they're easier to get up into space yeah definitely. um so you know it's um it, it's it's a win-win situation mm. but as you said it's just a shame that the company's really suffered and uh, yeah it's been sort of like put on the back burner yeah um so yeah it's it's it's, it's a fascinating uh 
subject and uh, it's something to look forward to yeah and in fact so, uh, it's very sad because yeah. if you go to the uh, the bigelow aerospace website it hasn't been updated since 2019 so you know i think i think for all intents and purposes it's yeah. it's dead mm. so there we are um so that's a brief look at uh, the space stations coming up and i uh, hope, hope you all enjoyed that There's some exciting things happening in space as ever and uh, there will be i'm sure plans for further space stations but you know putting a space station in orbit is not an easy thing to do so we should not be at all surprised no. if plans and deadlines slip um but you know we, we will have these things i mean the chinese are doing incredibly well with their space station and um you know uh, although they did not obviously be in the chinese it has it does have a military aspect to it as well uh but um but anyway um yeah interesting times yeah. ahead with with space station yeah as you said i mean there's been other space stations in space yeah. in the past um like i said we've talked about what's uh, what's up there at the moment and what's coming forward um i mean of course it all st started with the soyut uh the russians uh, yeah. um and they launched several um space stations mm. but they were also a bit crafty because they also disguised the civilian soyut uh, uh space stations uh, they were basically using it for their top secret military of course um of course. stations as well called asmire asmar or asmire something like that yeah. uh, well, then of course we had um skylab yes uh yeah, skylab. It's at the end of the um uh apollo they had loads of bits of Apollo lying around, so they said, "Right, let's build ourselves a space station and yeah. call it Skylab." Yeah. Uh, initially, they had lots of problems. Um, they used, uh, I think, it was the second stage of a, a, a Saturn V as the main core. They sent it up, but as soon as they sent it up, they, were, they had no insulation or anything like that. The temperatures started to, to rise you know silly temperatures mm. and of course with um, the instruments on board most of it include incorporating plastics when they got hot they um emitted um poisonous gases mm. so that had to be all right, sorted um, out and in the end what they did is they went up with a big gold blanket foil blanket wrapped it around the actual uh, space station and lo and behold it worked it yeah. reflected all most of the heat away remember, um, and again there was some good science done there sorry yeah, um, yeah there was a lot of uh, really great solar astronomy done on on skylab yeah. that had never been done before That's and cool. i remember the days uh, i remember seeing the the, the spacewalks to erect that sunshade over uh, mm. over the sky uh, it looked crazy but as you say it, it worked it brought the temperature down amazing yeah and like you say, also, with one of these solar panels got destroyed, so they had to go up that. Um, yeah, and then, that. and then, of course, um, but one of the things there is they didn't have a water recycling system, so all the, the everything that they needed had to be taken up with them. So, uh, yeah. but eventually that fell by the way. Then, with a bit of glasnost, we had the Mir um, and shuttle meetings where the Americans and the uh, Russians actually got together. Um, although they weren't that friendly, from what I understand, from what I've read, there was a bit of animosity and a bit of, uh, you know, language problems and things like that. So, uh, but yes, and then, um, like you said, then we got the Taigon ones, and then mm. the Russians and the Americans joined together, and we're back to the International Space Station. So, yeah. That's right. That's right. And if you want to read a very good book about Mia, uh, there's a book called dragonfly i can't off the top of my head remember who the author is but i've got it in the bookshelf over there and it's it's subtitled america and the crisis aboard mir and um it would do as a wonderful textbook on how not to do project management because <laughs> the because the um the the, the the tension and the the suspicion of, on both sides um was was amazing and it's 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 a great book all about the story of mir and the american involvement in it and uh, and all the the crises they had on on there, um, which uh, which included at one stage an oxygen cylinder catching fire and acting as a flamethrower on the space station, they they had all sorts of enormous <laughs> problems on near uh, near disasters. But there you are. Okay, yeah, well, we'd better move on. Yeah. I think um, unless you want to add anything else. I'm um, just going to say with the Mir one, of course, that's where 
the American slash uh, English chap, uh, Nick Foles, um, nearly had uh, well he had issues. They were um, guiding in a supply uh, rocket that was bringing up supplies to them, but it came in too fast. It missed the entry point, and he was watching it through a observation window That's next right. to where it was coming in, and uh, all of a sudden he got a Russian voice shouting at him, "Get to somewhere safe and lock himself <laughs> in." Uh, because it came in, it missed everything, and uh, it just crashed into the the Mir space station, creating a, a, a massive leak. But luckily, they were all self-contained, so they were they were saved. But yeah, that's that, uh, Nick Foles' um, brush with death. So yeah, they were testing they were testing an automated docking system, and mm. um, you know, sort of nearly at the last minute, the camera on the uh, on the rocket failed. Uh, so they 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 couldn't see um, they couldn't see where it was going and yeah it, it was it was a, a very nearly a major tragedy. Anyway, okay, right now tonight's main feature uh, we're very lucky to have Lou, who is going to tell us uh, all about um, our moon of the week. We'll have another moon next week, of course, but the first moon of the week is Saturn's moon Titan. So uh, over to you, Lou. Here we go. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much. Um, so this will be a, uh, the first in a series of uh, presentations on moons of the solar system. And, you know, there are over 220 moons around what, you know, what you might call normal moons or traditional moons around planets, over 400 around other small bodies, Kuiper Belt, TNOs. So out of the close to 700 moons in the solar system, what luck that what an honor that Titan gets to go first. I think that's just incredible. <laughs> well, I, I tell you what it is, Lou. Uh, it's to coincide with that lovely James Red image of Titan uh, released last week or the week before. Uh, so we thought Titan would be a good first place to start. Titan is a great place to start. And we've known this is a great place for many years. And I'm going to walk you through a little bit of the history of Titan exploration, tell you why it's an interesting moon, tell you why we are spending so much of uh, ESA and NASA tax dollars to, uh, to explore it. So let's get going. I can. You have control. I have control. Okay. There we go. So um, back in the 1600s, uh, the first uh, uh, notice, the first observations of Titan that were realized were uh, by Christian Huygens, the Dutch astronomer. And uh, of course, you'll recognize that name because that was what we named the, um, the Titan probe that, was, uh, that went out to Saturn with the Cassini spacecraft. We named it after Christian Huygens. So in this um, uh, excerpt from his uh, writings, you see Saturn and you see two stars. You see one in the uh, kind of at the three o'clock uh, position and one at the seven o'clock position. The three o'clock position is actually a star, but the one at the seven o'clock, that was in fact Titan. And he was able to watch that over time, see that it was moving, calculate an orbit. And so he's credited by the discovery of Titan. Then in uh, 1907, uh, with better optics, better telescopes, it was noticed that uh, Saturn has a quality called limb darkening. This is an edge effect that you see, that you would see in a body that has an atmosphere. So as you're penetrating down further into the atmosphere, rather than going from deep, deep space to solid surface, you see a gradation of uh, intensities. And this was the first indication that um, that Titan had an atmosphere. So that alone makes it unique among all other moons of the solar system. Then in the 1940s, um, uh, Gerard Kuiper, who you will recognize with the Kuiper Airborne Observatory was named after as well as the Kuiper Belt. He had two big things named after him. Um, I'm still waiting for my first thing, but I know it's, I know it's coming. Um, and he uh, did some spectroscopic observations of Titan and noticed um, uh, that there was methane, or as you say in the UK, methane in the atmosphere. See, I'm getting an error message. Something went wrong. Trey, reloading the page. Uh, can you see the slide? Uh, we can see the methane slide, yes. 
Okay, very good, very good. And we'll continue. So not only does Titan have a have an atmosphere, now there's methane in the atmosphere. And why is that interesting? Um, for a couple of reasons. Um, it is a biomarker. It, it can be the result of biological activity, or it can be um, a resource for uh, microbial, let's say, um, activity. And also, it shouldn't be there. Uh, methane is very uh, volatile and uh, gets broken apart into its uh, component elements of carbon and hydrogen very easily with ultraviolet radiation. So the fact that it is there on Titan is um, something that makes Titan even more interesting. So uh, just a few facts uh, about Titan. By the way, this is an, an image uh, that was taken by the Cassini-VIMS uh, uh, system, visual and infrared mapping spectrometer. This image is not what you would see if you were just kind of flying out there and looked out your window. Uh, in this image, we're looking through the very opaque photochemical haze that, sh that surrounds Titan down into the surface. So we see surface and lower atmospheric features. And you can do this between um, methane absorption bands in the, in the near infrared. And I'll be showing you other pictures and talking about that quality. But just kind of a, a kind of a, a Titan 101 here, um, diameter of 5150 kilometers, uh, surface gravity of 1.35 meters per second squared. Um, most of the atmosphere is nitrogen, predominantly nitrogen, just like a planet we all know and love, um, with other hydrocarbons and nitriles. The surface pressure 50% greater than the Earth. Uh, and because Titan doesn't have a, uh, as much gravity, its, it's uh, atmosphere is much more extended than Earth's atmosphere. And then, of course, um, it has all of these Earth-like features with seasons and rain and clouds and, and lakes and, and rivers. And you say, wow, what a great place. But it does all of this at a temperature of 94 Kelvin uh, for you Fahrenheit uh, friends. It's 290 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. So all of the um, uh, fluvial and atmospheric uh, evapotransport mechanisms that go on are not with water. They are with um, other very interesting uh, hydrocarbons. Just as a uh, comparison of Titan to all the other moons of Saturn, clearly the largest moon. Not all the other moons of Saturn, but many of the larger ones. And here's a comparison with just other solar system objects. So you see Earth and Venus on the left. Venus is about 95% the diameter of Earth. Mars is about half the diameter of Earth. And Titan is next and bigger than Mercury. So if Titan was not orbiting Saturn, uh, it would clearly be another planet. But it is orbiting Saturn, so we don't count it. Well, with all, with all of this, uh, these interesting findings, uh, it's no surprise that we've sent a number of missions out to um, investigate Titan. We sent the uh, uh, Pioneer 11 to Saturn. This is a flyby mission that uh, flew by in 79. Voyages 1 and 2 flew by in 1980 and 81. Again, flyby missions. And then uh, the Cassini spacecraft uh, uh, on its way um, uh, with gravity assist from Jupiter orbited uh, Saturn and dropped the Huygens probe into the atmosphere of Titan. Cassini made many, many um, close encounters with Titan uh, because it's a, it's a very uh, important object of interest. And we'll be uh, looking at some of the observations from that in just a moment. So um, early on, early robotic exploration, Pioneer 11 uh, went to the Saturnian system and, uh, and took some pictures of Titan. This, it turns out, now I guess, I'm, I'm not sure if my, um, I have something blocking it here, but this is supposed to be the first robotic spacecraft image of Titan. Of course, this is Saturn uh, the, uh, here in the middle here with its rings and the shadow of the rings on the, on the beautiful cloud tops of Saturn. But on the bottom, if, if, if it's still in frame, is a small dot, and that is the dot, that is the figure of Titan, wow. Pioneer 11. We've come a long way, haven't we, Lou? <laughs> oh, we have, as I'll show you in just a second. 
This was the best image of Titan taken by Pioneer 11 at a distance of 360,000 kilometers. Wow. Pioneer 11 had a two color camera. And uh, again, what we're seeing here is, uh, this is a, in, the, in the visible part of the spectrum. So you're seeing the, the atmospheric haze that, is sh that shrouds the entire planet uh, and uh, prevents visible wavelength uh, light from penetrating. Haze kind of like um, um, smog in, uh, in, in LA in the summertime, in Los Angeles in the summertime. Um, and this was the best image that Pioneer 11 had, and at the time, the best image that humanity had of Titan. Didn't learn a lot then. <laughs> uh, there, there, were, there was other data taken, uh, right. uh, spectroscopy of the atmosphere, magnetic field data, and so on, but that was the best visual image. Then in 1977, the two Voyager spacecraft were launched on flyby uh, missions to the outer solar system. And uh, over here on the left, we have, I think this is a Voyager 1 image of Titan, a uh, much better image. You can see a couple of things here, of course, the, um, the orange-red uh, photochemical haze. By the way, this is produced by the photo disassociation of nitrogen um, and, um, and, meth and um, uh, sorry, nitrogen and um, carbon in the atmosphere. And uh, the methane and the car and the nitrogen break into these amazing um, uh, concophony of chemicals, which makes Titan even uh, more interesting. You see that the top part of the uh, image here of Titan looks darker than the bottom part, and this is not a um, solar angle effect. This is a, actually a compositional and particle size effect because uh, the atmosphere moves wholesale from one hemisphere to the other every uh, Titan year. And uh, Titan year is roughly 29 and a half Earth years, just like Saturn, as it is tidally locked to its planet. You can also see on the top here, uh, just a little bit, uh, looks like it's a little bit not quite round at about your one o'clock position. And that um, that is the um, North Polar Hood, which is a, a region where um, uh, chemicals build up in the atmosphere in the winter season for that pole. On the right here, you see some models that we've been able to make of uh, the atmosphere of Titan, uh, showing the photochemical haze, the particulates and the, uh, that, are, that are produced, the haze layer further down. And then these hydrocarbons and nitriles kind of precipitate, precipitate down through the atmosphere and act as nucleation sites for other chemicals to glomp onto. And then they fall out under the surface. So, uh, temperature and pressure at, this, uh, pressure at the surface is such that methane can um, evaporate back up and form methane clouds or methane clouds. And so you have a methane cycle here instead of a water cycle that you'd find on Earth. This is just an example of some of the other kinds of data that we got from the Voyager spacecraft. Obviously, this isn't an image. These squiggly lines come from the iris, the infrared interferometer spectrometer on, uh, on Voyager. And this is from uh, the SATAT link on Voyager 1, very, very close flyby of, of Titan. That's quite a complicated um, uh, cacophony of chemicals there, isn't it? It is, it's complicated. It's hard to understand for most people. And so at the daily press conferences, when um, a plus or minus two weeks of encounter uh, out at Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, the imaging team got all of the press and all the oohs and ahs, and we'd show a few of these and nobody mm. cared. Um, but there's, a, there's an amazing amount of information in here. You can see um, many of the hydrocarbons and nitriles, HCN, hydrogen cyanide, C2H2, um, acetylene, um, CH4, uh, uh, methane, and so on, and ethane, C2H6. Lots and lots of these chemicals that are produced by this prebiotic atmosphere that Titan has. And these images, uh, these uh, little squiggly lines turned out to be very important in understanding the um, earth and evolution of Titan. It, how, just out of interest, how does that, does that compare at all with what uh, New Horizons found at Pluto? Uh, in, in some ways it does. Uh, for example, Pluto has a detached haze layer. We haven't shown that quite yet here, mm. um, that, um, uh, that Titan also has. Uh, Pluto's chemistry is different. It's colder. 
if you can imagine being colder than this. Oops, let's cancel that. Um, um, but it, uh, it also has uh, uh, many of the chemicals that we see here. Um, so uh, yes, and uh, I think it deserves its planet status just from that alone. <laughs> Indeed. So we move on, and in 1997, 20 years after Voyager, we launched the Cassini spacecraft along with its Huygens Titan probe to Titan. And again, this image here is um, from the VIMS uh, uh, instrument on Cassini showing the surface features of Titan. And here we start to see some darker regions. These are lakes on Titan. Um, you can see um, some of the surface as well as some highlighted parts of the surface, which are likely in this image, methane clouds in the lower, uh, the lower uh, uh, troposphere of Titan. There's the launch of Cassini. And here's an, an artist's rendition of what it would have looked like as Cassini approached the Saturnian system. It released the Huygens probe to, um, to fly uh, unaided um, into the atmosphere of Titan using aerobraking and then eventually a parachute, which as you might imagine was, um, is very efficient with a very thick atmosphere of Titan to uh, land on the surface. And just on that point, Lou, uh, somewhere on YouTube, there is a real-time record of um, Huygens' descent through the atmosphere that you can sit and watch, uh, which is uh, which is amazing. Ab absolutely. And, and so landing on the surface is amazing, and we got our first glimpses of the surface, which I'll show you in a minute. But for me, who studied the atmosphere of Titan, the um, progression of Huygens down through the atmosphere, taking measurements of temperature, pressure, composition at each level uh, was uh, even more, more important and more interesting. So we got a vertical distribution um, uh, of, the, of temperature, pressure, wind speed, composition, and so on at, that, at one place mm. and at one time, but uh, through the um, uh, atmosphere of Titan. Well, wasn't the, weren't the winds um, a bit different to what had been predicted? I seem to remember they they were, and um, the they were able to track the um, the probe using Doppler measurements uh, that were received by uh, Cassini and then sent to Earth. Um, and the uh, upper atmosphere was a little um, a little more turbulent uh, than they had predicted. The lower atmosphere not as turbulent, um, and um, so this is why you um, this is why you go there, right? Mm. I seem to remember that it, it took longer to descend through the atmosphere than they, they thought it was going to. I think so. Yeah, yeah. So we, yeah. we had just our, our models from um, uh, what we, little we knew from Voyager and from uh, ground base and uh, Earth orbiting observations. Yeah, and I'll show you some of those in a few minutes as well. Okay. So this and is it, just. Sorry, I was going to say, and it all worked amazingly. It was a, it was a flawless descent. Not only a flawless descent, but they pinpointed the landing a billion and a half kilometers away. So <laughs> in, my, in my way of looking at it, the real heroes of this mission are the people who understood the celestial mechanics um, of uh, how things operate in the solar system and are able to guide this thing miraculously to a pinpoint landing. Hmm. So the Huygens probe descended. It had a uh, camera facing, a downward facing camera. And we started to see now uh, through much of the haze, uh, started to see surface features. Uh, you can see um, what we were, <laughs> we, we used to call these um, fluvial channels or, 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 or flow channels. And um, uh, I, think, I think we were a little coy about calling them rivers at the time but you can see valleys and mountain ranges and fluvial channels. And then in the lower right, you see a, a little more uh, uh, magnified image of the surface in black and white here. Clearly you see the um, rivers. You can see the darker area on the bottom that's a uh, hydrocarbon lake. And these little puffy things here are methane clouds in the troposphere. Amazing. 
And I, I remember being at um, Cornell University uh, when um, I was working on this problem with Bob Samuelson. Uh, Carl Sagan was working on this problem and a group from Canada, whose names I'm sorry, I forget, were working on this problem of methane clouds in the atmosphere of Titan. We're all using the same data from Voyager 1 uh, uh, observations. And a uh, Canadian group said, there are clearly no methane clouds. Uh, Sagan and Thompson said, yes, there are. And Bob and I said, I don't think we know yet. <laughs> <laughs> turns out there are. Uh, so um, the probe landed on the surface. We knew that the surface was um, probably had um, a collection of liquids on it. And we knew that from atmospheric modeling from the Voyager uh, data, also um, from uh, active radar measurements from Arecibo, uh, where we bounced radar uh, signals off the surface to see what the scattering profile looked like. And so Huygens was designed to not only land on a hard surface, but a mushy surface or in a lake. And uh, it turns out that it landed in something kind of marshy. Mm -hmm. um, what you see here are uh, rocks, uh, probably water ice, uh, covered with um, tholins, these uh, atmospheric uh, prebiotic chemicals, hydrocarbons and nitriles and so on that are falling down through the atmosphere. And then you see some smoother areas which uh, uh, appear to be um, liquid hydrocarbons on the surface at the landing spot of Huygens. And some of those pebbles, if you like, are quite rounded, aren't they? As if they, They've definitely been in some sort of liquid. Uh, there is erosion on the yeah. surface, not only from li liquid and atmospherics and so on. And um, so, uh, yeah, there's, uh, they, they do not appear jagged at all. From the um, Cassini orbiter, they were able to um, take radar measurements of the surface. This is a false color image just to show detail. Well, I guess if you're doing radar measurements, you don't have any color, at least mm -hmm. in the visible part of the spectrum. But this just shows the uh, a collection um, uh, near the poles of um, uh, of lakes on the surface of Titan. Are, are the lakes restricted to the, the polar areas? Uh, they're not restricted to the polar areas. Um, we, can, we see them um, at all latitudes. So. Right. This is an interesting experiment that was done. This is called a radio occultation experiment. Um, you can um, uh, fly the spacecraft behind Titan uh, send a radio signal through the edge of the atmosphere and kind of pan down through the atmosphere. And then the Earth receives that signal, <clears throat> which is deflected at some angle or, and its intensity reduced at some proportion. And that, that observation gives you a quantity called temperature over mean molecular weight in the atmosphere and allows you to make temperature profiles. So the mean molecular weight is very, very close to 28 two times 14 uh, nitrogen, diatomic nitrogen. Um, and so we're able to get um, a temperature profile, at least for that location, showing how the temperature varies with height. And you can see here in this little graph that Titan has a troposphere like, just like the Earth does. It has a tropopause where the temperature turns over and starts increasing with height. And it has a stratosphere. Fantastic. Uh, I showed you a, uh, the Voyager's uh, infrared spectrum of the atmosphere. This is the Cassini infrared spectrum. This was taken by an instrument called SEERS, the Composite Infrared Spectrometer, aboard the Cassini orbiter. And um, so here we have much higher resolution data uh, identifying all kinds of chemicals, um, and uh, some of them building blocks for life, like hydrogen cyanide. Um, and so we see this atmosphere that is mildly reducing and... Um, and it also uh, produces uh, somewhat of a greenhouse effect on Titan. As cold as the surface of Titan is, about 95 Kelvin, <clears throat> there's about, a, and I'm sorry, I forgot to convert this, there's about a 38 degree increase in the surface temperature Fahrenheit from um, what it would be without uh, an atmosphere. And this is caused by these um, these, um chemical species that are uh, asymmetrical, absorbing um, absorbing energy and uh, re-emitting it back down to the surface, just like we have on Earth. 
And of course, of course, methane is a, an extremely potent uh, greenhouse gas. Yes, absolutely, and the and the primary volatile uh, species in the uh, in the lower atmosphere of Titan. Sure, sure. From all of this, we're able to construct some models of what the uh, internals of uh, Titan might look like. And what I want to point your attention to here is that um, there is some indication that there may be a global subsurface ocean uh, with liquid water, perhaps um, mixed with um, methane or other hydrocarbons. This is not uh, a surprise because when you fly a spacecraft by Titan and you measure the, the degree that its trajectory is um, modified by the gravity of Titan, it's not that much. And it equates to a bulk uh, density of about two grams per cubic centimeter. Right. Um, Earth is about five and a half grams. So the Earth is much more rocky. So we know there's a lot of water either in liquid form or water ice uh, making up the composition of Titan. This is um, another image from Cassini showing a region where it appears that there's some cryo cryovolcanism on the surface of Titan. This is suspected uh, for a while, but here we have some observational evidence. Really exciting finding. Um, three images uh, from, again, from the VIMS instrument uh, on Cassini showing um, all sides, all surface areas of Titan. Again, you see the darker areas as the uh, lakes. You see uh, the very white, whitish areas as clouds. Uh, you see uh, surface areas as well as some, um, um, I guess these are, uh, I think these are cloud regions, I'm not sure, uh, in the polar areas. Mm. Yeah, probably. I just think this is a lovely oh, image. Beautiful, look at that haze. <laughs> It's a bit, it's a bit colorized, but uh, you see the red orange uh, atmosphere of Titan and the detached haze layer that we, as I mentioned, that we see on Pluto mm -hmm. as well as Titan. And it turns out that I painted something that looks an awful lot like this about 30 years ago. Really? So I wonder if it was, uh, you know, prolific. <clears throat> this is one of my favorite images. Believe it or not, uh, Cassini got this image just at the right time, just at the right angle to have sunlight reflecting off one of the hydrocarbon lakes on Titan and wow. into the image of Cassini. Just remarkable. Is, is that reflection actually an image of the sun? <laughs> it, it is sunlight. It is sunlight reflecting off, off the lake. Yeah, but that, that bright spot is, is are we looking at a, a, a direct reflection of the sun? That's amazing. Oh, well, I don't know if that's, I, I wouldn't say that is an image, a, a, a spatially resolved image of the sun. Mm. I, think that, I think that's a gradation in. Yes, in probably, yes. Yeah. But yeah. it's very bright, isn't it? Amazing. Titan is an incredible world. It is. So this is an interesting place. It has uh, water, liquid water, probably. The models indicate below the surface. It has a prebiotic atmosphere. It has lakes and rivers and seasons and winds and uh, you know what do you want out of a out of a body in the solar system? And so we are spending uh, some more tax dollars, at least of the Americans American tax dollars, to go take an even closer look. And this is the Dragonfly mission that will launch, I believe, in 1996. I'm sorry, 2026. <laughs> 2026. I'm yeah. dating myself a little here. This is actually an octocopter. It will have eight propellers, uh, eight propeller systems that will fly it around through the atmosphere of, of Titan. Now, of course, we have a, a drone on the surface of Mars that's flying. Uh, Mars atmosphere being one about 1% 1 the density of Earth's, so that's a tough ordeal. Mm -hmm. But um, the atmosphere of Titan, 50% uh, greater surface pressure, no problem. And this and this drone, therefore, can be somewhat larger. And it's about the size of a maybe a small school bus. It's it's rather it's rather large with a, a RTG on the um, on the back end here, a radioisotopic thermoelectric generator 
nuclear power source. And it is going to parachute into the atmosphere of Titan. I'll show you here in a minute. I'll, uh, I'll go over some of the uh, parts. It, it will have um, uh, various instruments. Uh, of course, it will have visual imagers and spectrometers and um, instruments to measure the, um, the winds and pressures and temperatures and so on uh, at the surface of Titan. Just one thing occurred to me about that. Mm -hmm. Are they at all worried that if it lands on the surface, it might actually freeze and get stuck to the surface? <laughs> well, I'll tell you, um, in order to do that, you'd have to be able to, to liquefy water a little bit, right? Yeah, true. true. Water. That's not going to happen on the surface of Titan. Yeah. Um, no, the, this, is, uh, this uh, probe is being developed by the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory. And believe me, they are taking the cold temperatures and what we know of the composition of the surface uh, into account. I'm sure they are. And the hope is that not only will they get more information about this, the solid surface and the atmosphere, but also the liquid surface. Um, I believe there's a mass spectrometer on board that's going to be able to tell us more about the composition of all three of those. Uh, any idea how long they're expecting Dragonfly to last? Um, well, I, uh, let's see. I, I, be, I believe, I have to check, but I believe the, um, the planned mission on, on the surface is two years. Two years? Uh, Earth yeah. years. Earth years. Um, Earth years, yeah. But I imagine um, almost everything that we send up now is uh, 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 far more uh, durable than, um, than its planned lifetime. Sure. And so it, it's not unusual. In fact, I think it's almost the rule that we um, send up missions that, uh, are, uh, that exceed their lifetime and we ask for extended uh, funding. Mm -hmm. And we get that. And if you just look at the Voyager missions, you can uh, understand um, uh, what that's about. Let's see. It must be so incredibly hard to design a vehicle that's going to work in those low temperatures and work reliably. I, I suspect. I was um, in Barrow, Alaska a number of years ago, and I remember it was hard just to get my, uh, just to get my, uh, my cell phone operating and really 20, 40 degree below temperatures um uh let's see so uh two years is is um is not a correct number i think it's more like two months two months right or for the initial right for the initial planned mission right sorry but as you say it'll you know if if past experiences anything to go by especially with the uh, the mers then it'll probably last a lot longer right Uh, just a um, indication of uh, how it plans to get there. Many uh, gravity assists. Uh, that means you don't have to um, have as uh, large a booster, and you can do this more energy efficiently. It will begin aerobraking through the atmosphere of Titan, and then it will open a parachute that will uh, slow it down to, until it's able to drop its uh, drop its heat shield. And it's actually going to just drop this thing in midair and its rotors will begin operating and it will fly itself to, the, to its uh, uh, surface. And remember, we're a billion and a half kilometers away. So we're not using a joystick to do this. So it has yeah. some, it mm -hmm. has sensors and it has intelligence <clears throat> that's gonna be able to pick out a suitable landing site. Um, I think in I think in real stream, this can cannot play, okay. Right, so this was a um, uh, a video of it releasing the um, the Dragonfly uh, probe. Uh, oh yes, you'd, yes, you'd, you'd have to show your screen for that, unfortunately. Right, mm -hmm. and so it will um, it will copter itself down to the surface, uh, raise its communication antenna. It will, it will be able to receive signals from the Earth uh, over long periods of time. It, We'll send up um, uh, science packages to tell it what we'd like it to do. And then it will fly off and look for a suitable landing site. And it will actually um, be able to fly a little bit further. It does this kind of hip hop motion where it flies beyond that site, looks for other landing sites, comes back to the original site, and then does that same kind of um, progression again. Right. And I think that is 
Yeah, totally yeah. autonomously. Mm -hmm. Totally autonomously. That's right. Amazing. Amazing. Yep, that's it. Right. Well, thank you so much, Lou. And I hope, viewers, you've enjoyed that look at uh, at that uh, fascinating yeah, world fantastic. title. And uh, yes, yeah, thanks, Lou. That was absolutely fantastic. <clears throat> so there you are. That's Titan. And as I said, this is the first series, uh, first in a series of Moons of the Week. And uh, what would you, our viewers, like to see um, in this series? If you've got a particularly uh, a moon that you're particularly fond of and you'd like to learn more information about, then pop it in the chat now, um, and um, and uh, we'll 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 see what we can do. So, as for next week's moon, we need to discuss what we're going to tackle next week. But uh, I can guarantee you it'll be interesting because uh, button moon, button moon, button moon. Yes, okay. Yeah. Right, just don't give up your day job. And uh, Steve's got a question in the chat now. It, uh, I don't know if uh, anybody can help him with that. What happened? At, what happens at the end of mission? Uh, will the power generating device remain on Titan for good? Is there a danger of polluting? Well, uh, the mission will remain on Titan. It's not coming back, and so it's it's RTG will remain with it, and it should be. Um, it is well contained. Um, I think the, the, the prospects for pollution are very slim. You might remember that the Cassini spacecraft um, uh, also flew to Saturn with an RTG, and it did a number of gravity assists before it got there, and one of the gravity assists was with Earth. And so there were some environmentalists who were very concerned about what happens if it kind of misses its... Uh, trajectory and, and hits Earth's atmosphere and uh, this radioactive material gets in the atmosphere and kills us all. Um, and the truth is that this, um, this stuff is packed um, uh, very tightly. And uh, uh, my understanding is you can put a string of dynamite around these, uh, the, these RTGs, um, mm -hmm. this, this plutonium, and, uh, and blow it and, and you won't uh, see any degradation. So it's... Um, uh, uh, the opportunity for p pollution on Titan, I think, is very, very low. I mean, they they drop these RTGs out of planes at fifty thousand feet, and you know they they survive. So you know they are designed not to break open. They're baked into ceramics, actually. Mm. So that's 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 part yeah, of yeah. That's right. That's right. Well, a big thank you to Lou for uh, tonight's uh, Moon of the Week. We've got a couple of suggestions in the comments as to what uh, what other moons we should cover. Derek says Io. Uh, Mistook72 uh, says Enceladus. Uh, thank you, guys, for, for those suggestions. Uh, they, they would certainly be on my list as well of, uh, of ones that we're going to cover. So uh, stay tuned next week, and we'll bring you another Moon of the Week. And, uh, and thank you so much for your interest. Okay, um, well... If you have any comments, suggestions, feedback, death threats, ransom notes, blackmail notes, whatever, uh, you're free to mail us at any time, of course, at <laughs> not enough, Jonathan, um, at spaceoddityslive at gmail.com. And we always love to hear from you. So anything you want to say to us, do feel free to, to email us. We'll wrap things up for tonight, I think, unless the panel wants to say uh, say anything else. Um, um, just further to your um, inquiry about uh, Dream Chaser, the mm -hmm. Sierra and Nevada Dream Chaser. Yeah, it's uh, chalked into um, be launched December the 17th, um, but consider that as uh, a maybe because it's using a Vulcan Centaur, and of course uh, that still that's, hasn't that's flown a, itself that's yet. That's another so. vaporware rocket. So, yeah. Uh, so, uh, so there we are. Oh, by the way, a uh, big congratulations to Rocket Lab for their launch of uh, two much needed yeah. hurricane studying satellites from NASA. Uh, earlier in the day, uh, watch that flawless launch out of New Zealand on the uh, rocket on the rocket lab electron rocket, and uh, well done, guys! It was a great launch, um, absolutely flawless deployment of the satellites as well. So congratulations to Rocket Lab, and um, thank you all for being here. Thank you, and oh, thank you, yeah, Steve, thank you. for being here as well. So, Steve, just say thank you. We're, you know, we're delighted to bring this stuff to you every week. But of course, if you have any suggestions, anything you want to see, just drop us an email, and uh, and we'll do our very best to uh, to sort that out for you. And a big thanks to Rachel for the gallery. And of course, Rachel is um, is uh, doing the gallery for two now these days. So uh, she's she's gone off to get some much needed sleep. 
And uh, so we'd like to wish her the best, obviously. And sleep well, Rachel. And until next week, uh, thank you again to our sponsor, World of Valley Optics. Uh, thank you for uh, buying us coffees. And thanks for being here. I wish to look forward to seeing you again on Space Oddities same time next week. Until then, from all of us here at Space Oddities, have a fantastic week and look after yourselves. And we'll see you soon. Say goodbye, panel. Uh, goodbye, panel. Thanks for staying with us, everybody. Bye. Great show. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Take care, guys. Speak to you soon. And we will do something about the T-shirts. Promise. We will have a chat about that. All right, then. Crop tops, crop tops. <laughs> you can have a basque if you want one, Does <laughs> Oh, look at Jonathan's excited face perking up there. Ooh. I thought he was asleep for a Well, a, Sp a Spanish gorilla. <laughs> <laughs> All right, then. Take